I would like to begin the sermon today by stating the objective of this sermon, and I would like to do that by uh, making the following information about the sermon and stating that up front before we actually begin. The title of today's sermon is The Eye of the Needle. And I do have a question in the sermon, and the question is, will you fit through the eye of the needle? And I will repeat that question a time or two, and when I say, will you, will you fit through the eye of the needle, that reference is me included. Will we fit, but I'll probably say, will you fit, but I include myself in that group. The topic of the sermon today is the abundance of plenty in God's church. And the foundational scripture or the premise of the sermon comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, where a portion of that chapter says, When you have eaten and are full, will you forget the Lord your God? Now let me begin by quoting the scripture from which the title comes, if you'll turn with me, to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, and then we'll begin in verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I say again to you, this is verse 24, It is easier for a, cam for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's quite a bit of impact with that statement. It's easier for uh, a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. What a statement to be made. Now, most of us Americans have no idea what that statement actually means, myself included. Uh, as I read that, I always envisioned the eye of a needle. You know, my mother, as she got to be 40, she'd tell me to come over and I'd put that little thread right through the eye. I could see it now. Uh, today, I probably couldn't even see the needle. But back then, I'd push it through there, and that's what I always thought it was talking about. It is said that the eye of the needle was a security gate there in the wall of Jerusalem where a camel, and coming through the main gate to go through this next uh, needle, that it would have to, which it was, a camel was their beast of burden to carry things, would have to take off its saddle and its bags and all that paraphernalia for it to squeeze through that eye of the needle. Well, recently, and I don't know how recently, recently is, but the archaeologists are saying now that they have never been able to find that gate. They have never been able to find the eye of the needle, so now they question, is that really the meaning of that scripture? that it was a literal gate through which a, a camel would pass having to take off its saddle and its bags and what it was carrying. Either way, the point is, it is very difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Be that an eye of a literal gate or be that the eye of that sewing needle for a thread to go through, it is difficult. The question, once again, in this sermon is, will you fit through the eye of the needle? And the topic is the abundance of plenty in God's church today. And as we begin to leave and prepare for and then leave for the Feast of Tabernacles, a time that does depict a great deal of plenty, I trust that this topic will be fitting for each and every one of us, and particularly at this time of year. About a month ago there in the office, Mr. Franks uh, emailed a, an excerpt to me that he had taken from a 1963 Good News magazine. And as I read that and contemplated what it said and we exchanged a couple comments between each other, uh, it engendered the idea for this sermon. So let's take a moment. Let's go back 52 years ago in the history of the modern Church of God. Now, for our younger people among us, in 1963, the flagship magazine and publication of the church was a Plain Truth magazine. We also published a magazine entitled The Good News. That was more of a 
a very nice magazine, but it was a member publication primarily, and in that there would be updates and doctrinal articles and things of that nature. So in that particular 1963 Good News magazine, Mr. Frank sent me this excerpt. The context is, after the Feast of Tabernacles, and at that time, if I remember correctly, and I ask a few in the office, and I think this is accurate, at 1963, we had two feast sites in the United States. The main big one was Big Sandy, Texas, as we call Gladewater, Texas. The other was Squaw Valley. And the reference in this excerpt is to Squaw Valley there in California. And now let me quote to you. One of the most moving occurrences of the entire feast was the taking up of the offering on the last great day. As far as can be determined from all the records that have been kept throughout the history of the work, it was the single, excuse me, it was the greatest single offering given by God's people in this time. Nearly $45,000 was given by 5,400 people present. It was almost double the first day's offering, and we all hope it will prove to be a proper incentive to the brethren around the world to recognize the real need of God's work and to spur individual sacrifice to accomplish the fulfillment of that need. So that was the record high Holy Day offering that had ever been taken up in the modern history of the church up until that time. Those of you who have already done the math, and I know you are playing on your cell phones, that offering of 50, excuse me, $45,000 was $8.32 per person. $8.32 per person, and that was the largest single Holy Day offering in the history of the church up to that time. And as that little excerpt stated, that offering was twice as much as the offering they took up on the first day of the feast. And this was a record setter twice what was taken up on the first day of the feast. Now, if it was half, or approximately half, then that means the per-person offering, roughly, on the first day of the feast was $4.16. Now, as we look at the history of the Holy Day offerings in the church, the four, the four fall Holy Days, the largest offering, is typically the last great day. And if you look at that time, the attendees who were there in Squaw Valley were some of the more wealthy brethren of the church. And I would believe by comparison, a little more wealthy than those who were camping in Big Sandy, 10,000 in, in the tents there uh, at that time. Now, if you adjust for inflation, that $8.32 offering today, 52 years later, would be $38 and 74 cents. So we look and say, well, you know, $8.32, that's not a lot, a lot, but if you adjust that 3.1% inflation for 52 years, $38.74 per person. Today, our last great day offering typically is slightly more than $81 per person. So if you look at that figure, I think we can extrapolate from it that our offering today in the church adjusted for inflation is more than twice as large as it was then. And if that was the single greatest offering ever, which was twice as much as the one on the first day of Feast of Tabernacles, our Holy Day offerings today are two to four times higher per person adjusted for inflation than they were at that time. I believe it is an accurate statement to say that the members of God's church today in this generation are wealthier than they were in the early 60s. Now, of course, there are exceptions, but as a general rule. If one looks at the per person Holy Day offering, citing that from 1963, extrapolating from that, adjusting for inflation, uh, you'll see that today, today the members are richer. Now, I did not say they were rich but they are richer. They are doing better financially in general than at that time. Now let me uh, buttress that point and explain where I'd like to go in the sermon. 
When I pulled up to the parking lot today, and I've noticed this before, and when I pulled up to the parking lot in Fort Worth, and when I pulled into the parking lot there in Wichita, the cars that we drive, our members and all, and we drive today, those cars are far nicer than the ones that were driven in 1963. Now, some would say, well, sure, 1963, those, those were old cars. No. <laughs> In 1963, the cars the people drove were from the 40s and the 50s, and they were old cars in 1963. But you look in the parking lot today as a general rule and observation. In Dallas-Fort Worth and where I travel throughout the, the various congregations, the cars are of a nicer quality. They're newer. I don't think all of the members pray over them before they leave for church as, as once uh, we did. The amount of Holy Day offerings is larger. The standard of living of God's members today are a better standard of living. If you look today, the not everyone, but probably as a general rule, the vast majority of uh, people after services are over. I know they do in Fort Worth. They did all the time in Oklahoma and over in uh, Coleman and other areas. When services were over, people would generally go out for dinner, after services, and they would go to a restaurant, and a lot of people would get together. As I think back during that time, when I was a teenager in God's church, uh, that didn't happen. We did not go out to dinner after church. Uh, we had a social, or we went to someone's home, or they came to our home, or we just went back home. Uh, there would be exception, but I didn't know of anybody who went out to dinner after Sabbath services. That cost money. You had to be well healed to be able to go out for dinner. And then the people would look forward to the holy days. And on the holy days, the double service with the potluck in between. But when services were over after that second one, you headed out to a restaurant. That was, quite frankly, one of the highlights of the year. Today, again, to underscore that point, today in this modern time of God's church, the people of God are better off financially speaking. And without question, better off than they were 52 years ago. If you look at our children today, now I have adult children and I have grandchildren, but if you look at our children, of course, there are exceptions. But as a general rule, general rule, they're doing better than I am. Uh, they're, they're better off than I am. And without a question, they're better off than I was when I was their age. And they have been blessed, and I would say they are far better off. Now, as I'm discussing it, some might say, well, he's, I'll tell you where he's going next. He's talking rich and increased with goods. Is he calling us Laodiceans? Well, let's take a look. Let's look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and this is the final message to the final church seven churches listed. And if you look at verse 15, just breaking into the comments that were made to the church at Laodicea. It says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will, New King James says, vomit you out of my mouth or spew you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Well, brethren, the argument in this scripture is not so much against physical wealth per se but it's their spiritual condition. It's their spiritual condition that spiritually they thought they were wealthy and increased in good and had need of nothing. And the message of Christ through John tells them, I counsel you to buy gold tried in fire. Uh, do you not realize that you're really naked and, and blind and miserable, spiritually speaking? That the argument wasn't against wealth per se. Now, if someone trusts in their wealth, then that is a spiritual problem. But they had a spiritual problem. God said they were lukewarm. They weren't hot or cold. 
context is, especially when he says, I will spew you out of my mouth, uh, really relates very heavily to an end time protection for God's church. And to these people, he says, I will spew you out of my mouth. Uh, from a place of protection and closeness to Christ to a time of being uh, cast away at that time. So my argument is not that we are Laodiceans. In fact, I think as the sermon progresses, you'll see quite the opposite of that. We do, of course, have to be on guard if someone does trust in what physical things they have. That, I think that is a given. But what it's saying there primarily is their spiritual conditions. They knew they didn't know how far they had drifted from God. They were not hot on fire for the work. They were still God's church, so he couldn't say that they were ice cold, but they were not pleasing to God. And as the scripture says, he spewed them from his mouth. I'd like to ask two questions and then explore those questions. First question would be, when is the hardest time to call upon God and seek to be close to him? When is the hardest time to do that? The other question is just the opposite. When is the easiest time to call upon God and seek to be close to him? When's the easiest time to do that? Let's look at that second question first. When is the easiest time to call upon God and seek to be close to him? I'll give you the answer, then I'd like to give examples to strengthen that answer. The easiest time to call upon God and seek to be near to him is when you have the greatest need. When you know you have nowhere else to turn and you realize there's no help out there, nothing else you can do for, for yourself, your friends can't help you, you're in a dilemma, you're facing a problem, and you turn to God. And you turn to God from a heart, from a position of need. It's not unlike the, the question, you know, what is the, what is the best and most effective position to be in when you pray? I remember as a teenager in the church, this was asked of the minister, and he stood, sat there. I think, I think it was a Bible study. Uh, this particular example has legs, and you've probably heard it before. But the question and the comment that was going on, well, what is the best position to pray? Is it on your knees? Is it on your knees with your arms stretched up? Is it on your knees, arms stretched up, facing Jerusalem? Is it flat on your face? Is it sitting in a chair? Is it speaking your prayer out loud? Is it thinking your prayer? All of these different things. What is the most effective position for prayer? And then the minister said, well, let's say you're out on your property and you stumble across the well and you fall head first into the well. And the well's this big, about like this lectern, and you're about my size. Well, you're going to go down so far and you're headed straight down and the rope that's tied to the bucket gets twisted around your foot. Now you're hanging upside down in the well. He said, you can pray a very effective prayer in that position. That can be the optimal position to have an effective prayer. And I would agree with that. The point being made is when you're in a time of need and you turn to God, that is an easy time to turn to God. When you realize you have no help, you realize that God is your only source of intervention or survival, and you cry out to God, that is a good thing. If you've lost your job, if you're three months behind in the rent, if the tow truck is coming to take your car for lack of payment, your child is sick, your wife is in the hospital, you wonder where your next meal is going to come from, and you call out to God for help, that's a good thing. If you don't call out to God in situations such as that, and you become bitter because of your circumstances, or you choose to steal to remedy the problem, that's the wrong approach. But when you have those type of needs, it is for a Christian. It lends itself to turn to God. And one turns to God and prays and asks for his delivery for us in that time of need, that time of trial. A main lesson that we are to learn when we have a test or we have a trial is will we continue our relationship with God and rely upon God for all that we have? I don't have an argument 
when you and I approach God from a time of need. When you're as low as a chinch bug and you turn to God, that's fine. Now, I don't know how low a chinch bug is. Growing up, my mother and her family, they'd say, well, how are you feeling today? Well, I'm as low as a chinch bug. I never saw a chinch bug. I don't know how low that is, but I think it's fairly low to the ground. So if you're as low as a chinch bug and you've got no other, no other options out there, yes, it is right and correct to reach out and cry out to God. And that is, and those circumstances lend themselves to one doing that. Now, let me take just a few moments to give some personal examples. Uh, I have been, as I think many, if not all of you have been, as low as a chinch bug at several times in your life. Um, I think I mentioned one time here before, I hate to admit it, but I am afraid of heights. Uh, always have been as a kid, still afraid of them today. And as a kid growing up in St. Louis, uh, the baby boomer generation, there were just bunches of us and we explored everything and went everywhere together. It was almost like our, our, the little rascals are our gang, although they preceded us by 20 or 30 years, let me add. But we did about everything, and one of the things we did for the first time was there was a train trellis that went across the River de Pair in St. Louis. Now, it was a high trellis, and it was only for trains. There were no handrails. There was nothing but the railroad ties and the space between them. So when this group of guys were probably five or six or seven of us, we're going to go across that. And I will be honest, when I got up there and I started looking, I was frightened. I was scared to death. The other guys didn't bother him at all. Now, if you're a guy, you're not going to be the one who stays on this side. You're going to go. But my buddies knew me, so I had one of my best buddies beside me. There was one in front, one in back. And, you know, they're, they're giving me the raspberries, as one might say. You know, come on, Taylor, you can do it. You know, and I'm, I'm walking. I'd, I'd look down there, and I'd see the wind would be blown. There's no handrails. There's this space. And we're going. We're about four-fifths of the way across, and then behind us, we hear the train whistle. And there was a turn, and we looked back, and you could hear it coming. Now, what did they do? They weren't afraid. They were skipping like does and rams. They went right across there, and they're going, what did I do? I fell to my knees for two reasons. One, I was scared to death, and I was started to crawl. And the other thing was I was praying. You don't make much time when you're crawling on a train trellis and your buddies are over there. No one came back. And I looked back then, I saw that train with its light. And the faster I went, the louder I prayed. And when I got to the other side, just beating the train, I was there. I had no one to rely on. That was an effective prayer. And God delivered me. I remember as a teenager when it <clears throat> came time to apply for college. My father was not a member of the church. My mother was. And uh, came time and my dad, he wanted me to go to Rolla School of Mines uh, there in Missouri. We lived in Kansas City and he wanted me to be a civil engineer. And he would talk about that and he said, son, okay, you are going to apply to Rolla School of Mines. I want you to be an engineer. And there would be my mother sitting there, and I son, I want you to apply to Ambassador College. Uh, you don't want to go to Rolla School of Mines because this, this, and that. Then my father would say, I do not want you to go to that college and come out a jaked leg preacher. I never knew what a jaked leg preacher was, but the way he said it, that's something I would never want to be. So there would be my dad, and he would make a very cogent argument, and then there would be my mother. And then I'd go to church, and I'd hear from and the sermons and the announcements and the Bible studies and all about Ambassador College and the opportunities to go there. Then I'd come home, I'd be talking with my dad, and we were very close. And he would tell me, he said, son, you got to promise me. You're not going to go to Armstrong's College. You are going to go to Rolla School of Mines, aren't you? I was in a dilemma. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I was a... Not to brag, but I was a praying individual then. I fasted regularly. So I asked God. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to please my dad. I wanted to please my mom. 
My dad laid out for me, if you go there and you're an engineer, you'll have a secure job. He even talked about benefits. I didn't even know what a benefit was in those days. You'll have this, you'll have this level of income. And then my mother, she would say, you know, talk to me privately. If you'll go there, you'll be with God's people, and you'll learn the Bible, and you'll be able to do that. And I said, but I don't want to be a minister. Well, you probably won't be anyway, but you'll know your Bible, and you'll get to do this, and you'll get to do that. Well, finally, I, in praying, I asked God, I said, I, I just don't know what to do. I said, Father, so whichever college accepts me first, even as I say, that does sound a bit arrogant. I will admit to that at this point. But I said, whatever college accepts me first, that's the one I'll go to. And lo and behold, I applied to both. And lo and behold, I think it was March. Uh, Dean Blackwell was my pastor, came to the house. And he told me, he said, Brett, he said, I got to tell you, he said, you just got accepted to Ambassador College. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, um, out of all the, we said a lot of kids to college from Big or from uh, Kansas City. He said, in all the years that I've sent recommendations in, I have never had one come back this early. He said, I've never had one come back this early. You're accepted to Ambassador College. Now let me hasten to add, they didn't need me at Ambassador College. I did not have the most sterling transcript and. and personality and ability that they had to have me. But I believe God answered that prayer. Uh, I believe that with my whole heart. Uh, I had nowhere to turn. I had done my homework. I had thought about it. I just didn't know where to turn. And I asked God if he would intervene. And he did. And that prayer, and I prayed that prayer every night and twice on the Sabbath, for two or three months. And I just needed God to intervene, and he did that. I was praying to him from a position of need. And it was very easy to pray that prayer. Just very quickly, in 1995, my wife and I, when we had the doctrinal troubles in the church, <clears throat> and I forget the number, Mr. Franks would probably remember, but 160 or maybe 200, I forget, ministers went to Indianapolis. And we had a series of meetings, and of course Don and I had prayed a great deal about that before we went. But we'd sit in those meetings, and we would discuss things openly, and we would take a break, and we would go back to our motel room. And we weren't the only ones doing it. But we'd go back to our motel room, and we'd put two pillows on the floor in front of the bed, and kneel together, and I would pray first out loud. And I was in a position that I knew I wasn't big enough, strong enough, smart enough to figure it out. And we needed God's help, not only personally, but if a church was to be started, we needed God's intervention. And I would pray, then I'd ask my wife to pray. And Donna would pray, and then I would pray. And then we'd stand up and we'd just clung to each other. And uh, I, I, it's one of the times in my life that I just felt absolutely hopeless. Well, not, not hopeless, I mean, from a position of, of lack of strength and ability to work something out myself. We go to the meetings, meet two or three hours, come back to the hotel room, kneel down again. I would pray first out loud. I'd ask her to pray first. I mean, secondly, then I would pray, then would stand up and hold hands. And we did that each one of those days. Now, I only share that with you is that you will know as this sermon progresses that I have, as have you, besought God in a time of need when there were really no other answers, no other places to turn to, not big enough, not strong enough, not smart enough to work it out oneself. The only answer was God and God's intervention, and that had happened. And I could give you, quite frankly, another score example of when I have been in that position. If you lose your job when you go to the feast, if you have a baby that's sick, if you have a wife in the hospital, you can really pray, and that prayer comes very easy. When is it easiest to seek to be close to God? To reach out to him, 
to rededicate yourself to him, to rely on him as you show him your need. It is in the time that you need him most. That's when prayer, that's my experience, that's my experience in being with the brethren of God, that that type of prayer comes easy in a time of crisis. It's easy to pray when you're lost in the wood on a hunting trip. I've done that before, lost in the woods, and pray no other way out. But did you know it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God? So when is the hardest time to call upon God? When's the hardest time to seek to be close to him? Let's turn now to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy 8, and we'll begin in verse 4. The context here is a, a final speaking, not final, but close to a final speaking of God to the Israelites as they had wandered for 40 years, all they had been through, the trials, the suffering that they had, and the blessings. The being taken care of by God during all of that time, and now God is rehearsing for them when they reach that promised land. When no longer would they be fed with manna, uh, we'll read the scripture about the shoes. Notice here, Deuteronomy 8 and then verse 4. God is reflecting for them what he had done for them during those years. He says, your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Those clothes lasted. The manna lasted for 40 years. Now notice verse 6. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God and to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water. Remember how the Israelites would have to pray to get water and strike the rock and, and just going from almost like an envision water hole to water hole or when God would just intervene for them and the food wasn't there and they got tired of the man. I'm sure they had manna porridge and manna stew and manna fritters and manna manna, you know, for all those years. And God took care of them. But he says, where I'm taking you is a good land. It's a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of the valleys and the hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees, of pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. Verse 9. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron, and out of those hills you can dig copper. Verse 10. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full, and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied, verse 14, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Then finally, verse 17, then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And brethren, there is the warning. Uh, that's quite frankly the foundational scripture or the foundational principle or premise of this sermon. That's the scripture that I thought of when Mr. Franks forwarded that excerpt to me from the Good News magazine. And immediately I did the per person and then a little bit later I calculated the time value of money to see what's that worth today. And we do have so much more than we had in that time frame. We have so much more today among our members than we did in the 70s, and I would say the 80s, and the 90s. And we have been blessed. I believe there's a reason for that blessing. We have been blessed by God. When you've built your houses and when your flocks have multiplied, will you remember God? Will you turn to God? Or will we think and look and say, all these things that we have, I've gotten them myself. Discounting where we came from and discounting what God has done. The main point or a main point of this sermon is, can you maintain your relationship when things go well? 
Can you maintain your relationship with God when things go well? Now, in Matthew 19, let's see what the context is of that statement that Christ made. Matthew 19 and verse 16. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Christ tells him what he needed to do is essentially keeping the commandments. He says, I've done that since I was a youth. Verse 20. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Verse 23, Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now notice in verse 25. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? I mean, it was a startling statement that Christ made. And notice what he said in verse 26. But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now, brethren, in the remaining part of this sermon, we really have to keep in mind what Christ said. For man, if I may paraphrase, paraphrase for man in general, for a rich man to turn and rely on God and do those things where he surrenders him or herself to God for the typical carnal rich man he can't do it but with God all things are possible we can take from that scripture with God's spirit with God's help that gives to us a supple and malleable heart we can, if one is increased with goods, if one is better off financially uh, than our antecedents have been in the modern history of the church, it is possible. Another main point of this sermon is, yes, I believe this generation of God's church, this present generation can and will maintain their relationship with God. In this time of plenty, I personally believe that this generation can do that. If you look at the history in Judges and 1 Kings and 2 Kings, it's not exclusive to those books and chapters, but uh, in my commute uh, to Allen, uh, I have a Bible program that I listen to most of the time. It's the Bible read by Alexander Scoresby and going through Judges and First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. If I could just paraphrase that, it was almost you know this is the end of chapter one, and this is the end of chapter two, and this is the end of chapter three. Not exactly, but virtually the story that was being stated in the Bible, and I was hearing in my ears, was this: when Israel had it good, they turned to paganism. And they were embedded in paganism. And that God punished them by having an outside king or kingdom come and beat them in battle. Either enslave them or have them give tribute. And now they were beaten down. And after about 20 years, again I'm paraphrasing, they, the Israelites cried out to God, repented, God heard their prayers, God removed the enemy, they won the next big battle, and now they're close to God for about 20 years. End of chapter 2. Chapter 3 begins, and after 20 years, the Israelites turned to paganism, and then God sent the Assyrian king. And the Assyrian king came in there and enslaved the people and took their property, demanded their tribute, and then for about 20 years, Israel cried out, repented, and God intervened, and it's over and over and over again. The point I'd like to make is when Israel cried out to God, it was a from a position of abject need. That's when they cried out to God. 
when their barns were full, when they did, weren't under the suppressive rule of an outside nation, when they didn't have the threat of attack, they weren't turning to God. They jumped right back into paganism. As soon as it became dire, they turned to God. When you look at that over time, in my words, in my, the way I would state it, God finally got fed up. Went through that for all of those generations and finally with the Israelites, he said, okay, Assyrians come in and take them away. And he did it. And Judah, about 130 years later, I'm fed up with you too. Nebuchadnezzar come in and you know, take them away in captivity for, for 70 years. From my perspective, this generation of the church is different from what I have personally seen in the 43 years in the field ministry that I've had the privilege of serving. This generation has been tried in the area of doctrine, church government, the law of God, the role of grace, juxtapose the law of God, the Sabbath, the holy days, personalities, health, etc. Been tried and tested through all of that if you look at the generations of the 50s and the 60s into the 70s, I don't remember a challenge of doctrine. But we've lived through that, and we've lived through that more than once. And here we are today. We've been through that, and now here we are. By analogy, and only by analogy, I believe that what we see today is a winnowing down of the numbers, a winnowing down to the numbers of Gideon's 300. Now that's not a fixed number that is only by analogy. We've gone through some very trying times, uh, very hurtful times, very disappointing times. But we, the numbers are smaller. From my perspective, this church has gone through drought, and it's gone through famine. It's gone through challenges physically and spiritually. But now we've come to a time of physical plenty and spiritual plenty. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is not to be apologized for. There is a spirit of optimism and desire to do God's will and God's way and to serve that I have seen across the generations within the church today, young and old alike. Old timers, young adults, teenagers, middle-aged folks. I've seen it. And again, from my perspective, I have not seen its equal across those groups of people in my time within the church. Now, I believe this generation is the recipient of the blessings of God for having lived God's way for many generations. There's always exceptions, of course. But we have sitting among us today, we have Christians who are third generation, fourth generation, fifth generation Christians. Whereas you look at their heritage, they have heritage within the church where their grandparents or great grandparents were in the church. And their grandpa and grandma, their mom and dad, their siblings, and now they have children in the church. There is to be tangible fruit of living God's way over time. Tangible fruit. A culmination, as I might say, of generational blessing. Now, of course, there are exceptions. There are exceptions to all of that, and there are reasons why there are exceptions. And you can have someone who's doing very well, then they have a difficult time, and then they bounce back from that. But in general, I believe we've come to this generation, which is a culmination of people who have been a part of this church for many, many years. Uh, my grandchildren, who I love dearly, are fourth-generation Christians. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Frank, I believe their children or grandchildren are fourth-generation Christians. 
Uh, my grandchildren have a higher standard of living than I did when I was a kid. Uh, my children now have a higher standard of living than I have now, and that's fine. That's great. I'm not jealous of that. I look at my son, I say, you are my retirement, and, I, and I'm happy for him. <laughs> but I believe we're at the time where we have a legacy of church families who have obeyed God's law and have turned to God in a time of need and in a time of plenty. And that turning to God in a time of plenty is critical in evaluating does that individual have a Christian heart that is soft and malleable in the hand of God. You know, speaking about our, our children during, doing well, let's go back not too long ago. It was at the Feast of Tabernacles in Corpus Christi. And typically during the feast, probably not all, unlike most of us, uh, up until that point, we would take the kids out for one really good meal. I mean, not that we were eating, you know, Rice Krispies the rest of the time, but, you know, a good meal where I would tell them, is, okay, you kids can have anything that you want. And I normally didn't take them to the most expensive restaurant, but it was better than Luby's. I'd say, okay, you could have, you know, <clears throat> it's the feast here. This is our night. Just family, we'll go out. And, and they just loved it, and I did too. But we're at the feast, and in fact, the Franks were there. And from my, in my view, the nicest restaurant in Corpus Christi was the Republic of Texas on the 20th floor uh, of the Omni Hotel, or once it was the Marriott, and once it was, I think, the Hershey Hotel. 20th floor. Uh, ceiling to floor windows overlooking the bay and we had made a reservation so it was Jim and Sharon uh, Aaron and Kim Don and I and my son-in-law Dan and Laura so we go there and it was a nice night it just was uh, we had uh, before dinner cocktails not in excess but before dinner cocktails we had wine with the meal we had appetizers. They had, app they had a beef wellington appetizer that was to die for. We had steaks. We had the side salad, all a la carte. We had the potato. We had the dessert. I don't remember if we had an after dinner cordial or not, but we're sitting at this round table of eight overlooking the bay, and it was fabulous. And then the waiter comes with the check. And I probably blanched, and I'm thinking, okay, whew. And he's going to say, do you want this all on one? I said, I hope he doesn't ask me that, you know. I'm just hoping I can cover Don and me. And um, he came, and then when he brought the check, Aaron and Dan say, split it. We'll take care of it. And there we were. And uh, quite frankly, I mean, I was relieved. I was touched. <laughs> I never expected that in my life. I never even thought that way. The history had been when we went out, I would always take the kids out. And here we were at the nicest restaurant, and it was a very nice meal. And there were our two son-in-laws, our daughter, taking us out for dinner. And, and it really made a point. And if you juxtapose that when I was there, they were in their 20s at that time, I couldn't have taken eight people out for dinner in my 20s. I wasn't prepared to take those eight out that night either, uh, but they did it. I do believe, brethren, that, if you will, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28, that God does bless. I believe we are in a period of time where as a church we have been tested in lean times, and in times that are fat, if I may put it that way. Fat by comparison to the leaner times of days of yore. Uh, we just are. I, I really don't, and there are exceptions, but I don't think we could really argue that point as a church. But if you look at the blessings, and I'll read just a few of Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 is a parallel a chapter of uh, Leviticus 26, it gives the blessings and the cursings. And as we read here, it is a blessing and cursing of a national position for Israel. So that's what it's dealing with. But I do not think it would be inappropriate to apply this to individuals as far as a blessing. Because the lesson is what God will do 
if we are obedient to God and put him first. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1. Now, it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to obey carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall you be in the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Verse 5. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Verse 9. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Verse 11, and the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body and in the increase of your livestock and in the produce of your ground and in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. And now verse 13, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath, if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and be careful to observe them. Now, I won't go into the negative side of the curses. I'd like to focus on those blessings, national as they were given, but I believe in principle applies to the generations of God's people, especially leading toward that end time of how he will bless. It is God's desire to bless from a vantage point of obedience. Now, obedience does not earn a salvation. It never has. But obedience does earn a tangible reward according to one's work. And the Bible was, is replete with scriptures on that, on that subject. As I mentioned before, I see old timers, I see young adults, I see teenagers who are committed to God in this way of life after having been tried and tested as I personally have not seen in the history of the modern church. There are, of course, exceptions, but I believe Revelation 3.8 and Revelation 3.10 applies to this group of brethren. It is easier to see the need to rely on God when you're poor, or desperate than when you're rich. That's why Jesus said it's so difficult for a rich person to enter into the kingdom. As I mentioned, I've been driven to call upon God from a position of, of being absolutely desperate and needy. And there's no argument against that. That's what God wants us to do. But to call upon God when you're not in a position of being absolutely desperate. To turn to God then, God is looking for that deeply converted heart, one that will do that. Why is it so hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? Brethren, the rich have so many other options. Rich by definition, their needs of food, clothing, and shelter, it's already covered, and they have reserves. In the area of respecters of people, by not only society, but I think the way human beings are, there's a deference given to someone who's powerful or someone who's rich. And we may be seeing that in Donald Trump. It is said a rich man's jokes are always funny. The rich aren't motivated out of physical need. The rich have far more options. Bottom line, it's easier to need God and to see the need for God when you're poor and desperate than when you are rich. And I believe we can see why God made that statement through Jesus Christ. However, if one turns to God when you're rich, comparatively speaking, then you are a converted man or woman driven from a soft and tender heart. And you're not solely, solely driven from a position of need. And I hope I have painted that picture correctly so I don't have to restate it over and over. There's nothing wrong with seeking God from a position of need. That's the bottom line of a test or trial. 
But if you go and you seek God with that same fervency, as he showed there in Deuteronomy, and you, you seek him and you strive for that when you're not motivated just because of need, when you have no other options, that's the heart that God's looking for. That's the person who God can do so much with. But in our relationship with God, we have to answer this personally. How is it when things are going well? How do we cry out to God when things are going okay? Now, brethren, God does not hate nor does he disparage rich people. In fact, if you look in Scripture, God has used rich people mightily. Have you ever considered the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph? You know, we're introduced there with, with Abraham, not introduced, but we come to the point, is it uh, uh, Genesis 14, when Lot was taken captive, or 18, he's taken captive, and it says, and Abraham, among his servants born within his household, he was able to arm 314. That's 314 servants or employees in his household to go to battle. We have 76 full-time U.S.-based employees in the Church of God, a worldwide association, and we make payroll every two weeks. He had 314 who were of the age to be able to draw a sword. Now, God said he told Noah, he said, you know, build an ark. He had 120 years. It doesn't give the details. God may have brought all the lumber and the tar and the pitch just like he brought the animals. But what if he didn't? What if he called upon Noah, found grace in his eyes, and Noah was able to afford to build that ark? Now, it doesn't say that, but it does not not say that either. It just doesn't say. David was rich. Solomon was rich. It worked for David. It didn't for Solomon. If you have an individual whose relationship with God is not based solely on physical need, one whose physical needs are met, yet that individual is willing to give himself, himself over to God, lock, stock, and barrel, such as Abraham, David, Daniel, Job, and many others, God can use that person in service to others. Brethren, God is looking for that tender heart that seeks him. Have we come in this time frame in the modern history of God's church in light of prophecy of end time events? Have we come to the tried and tested generation that willingly calls upon God out of their abundance and not solely out of their physical need? I believe that we have developed to a point where we do cry out to God from a heart that wants to yield to God. I see so many young adults who are not driven out of abject physical need, but they're driven out of a converted heart. And I see people among us, and I see from my perspective the vast majority, who in this time of plenty relatively speaking, to the modern history of the church who seek God diligently. We do seek him when there's a great time of need, but when we seek him, as Deuteronomy shows, when you've entered into the promised land, chapter 8, and there are bubbling brooks, and you have beautiful houses, and your barns are full, and your flocks have increased, will you still turn to me then? Well, brethren, that's what God is looking for. It may be that this is that generation of the church. That God can rely on this generation to shepherd his people through the trials of the end time all the way to the glorious time of Jesus' return. Question is, will you fit through the eye of the needle. Time will tell.